Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me virtually. I'm here to talk about Apache Airflow's deferrable operators and how it can help you save tons of money. Uh, before that, a little bit of background about myself. Um, my name is Kakshil Naik. I'm the committer and PMC member of the Apache Airflow project. I work at Astronomer as the director of Airflow Engineering. And my main work is improving Airflow directly by contributing to it or building tooling on top of Airflow uh, to improve the DAG authoring experiences, uh, which has been my main focus area for the past few months. So let's uh, dive in with a quick refresher on Airflow for those of you who are, are not aware about Airflow. What is Apache Airflow? Uh, it is a platform to programmatically author, uh, schedule, and monitor workflows. Author it in Python uh, using the DAG, uh, schedule it using the cron expression, a time delta object, uh, or with the newer versions of Airflow, we even support custom timetables. And monitor workflows using the Airflow's UI, uh, the Airflow's web server, where you can check the status of the individual task and also the DAG. So, uh, so let's look at this basic example. It's very simplistic ETL DAG, uh, which, which does extracts some records from somewhere, let's say, and there's some sort of transformation here. It's a very simple transformation, just adds uh, the data that is available and then loads it somewhere. Uh, and the figure on the right just shows you how the dependency graph looks like and what uh, the output of the, of the DAG code is. Very simple enough, simplistic, uh, and yeah, that's it. Like this is Airflow. It's an orchestration tool uh, where you can write your workflows uh, in, in a way that you can version them and then just run them and even observe them. Uh, and it has been the de facto standard um, for the data engineers of the world. But let's 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 get back to our main topic for today. Uh, let's talk about differable operators. That's why we are here today. So. In today's presentation, I will first explain why do we even need differable operators? What problem do they solve? Um, how do they work? And finally, how to find uh, available operators and available differable operators and uh, use it. Uh, and if you want to build yours, how, how can you build their, uh, how can you build your own differable operator? So we'll, we'll cover at least these three topics. So Main question, why do we need differable operators? Aren't the standard operators perfect and just work? Well, let's, let's answer it. So let's first look at how Airflow runs the task you define in your DAG. So if, uh, like I showed in the, in that figure, right? You have some DAGs defined in, uh, you have some tasks defined uh, in your DAG uh, from there or how does Airflow pick it up? So, Airflow uh, deck processor parses your file continuously and this uh, and stores some metadata for it in the metadata base. The scheduler then checks, uh, the scheduler first then creates a DAG run for your DAG and then creates task instances for each of the tasks that is available in your DAG. The task or uh, the task is just an instantiation of your operator. Task instance is saying that my task is running at this time, that is a task instance. So Airflow first creates a diagram for your DAG, then it creates a task instance. Now the scheduler checks that whether the task dependencies are met for the task instance or not. If they are met, it marks it as queued. It marks the task as queued and sends it to the executor. The executor, I have not shown the executor here, but uh, executor is part of the scheduler currently where it just runs the executor. So the executor now takes that task, uh, takes that queued task and figures out figures out how to run it depending on type of the executor. Uh, Airflow by default ships with different types of executor. Salary executor, Kubernetes executor, local executor, sequential executor, uh, and, and a few others, but these are the widely used ones. For salary executor, the task is sent first sent from the executor to the broker, which is which can be Redis or RabbitMQ, uh, which then assigns it to the worker based on how much load is already on the worker. Now, the worker runs this task. For example, if the task is uh, using Bash operator, it runs the Bash script, or if it is if it is using a Python operator, it just runs a Python script. 
This is a standard task, typical operator. But yeah, this is a typical operator. Um, now there are different kinds of tasks that you can run, right? One that uh, just runs a script like the bash operator or the Python operator that we talked about, or does any sort of CPU intensive work. You can like do CPU intensive work, even with bash operator, you could run your machine learning model. You can have a specialized uh, operator that does uh, machine learning model training. Uh, but in this case, the worker is doing something compute intensive, right? Uh, in this example, it, it is crunching your data, it is processing your data and using all the available resources. CPU has spiked 200% for it because you are crunching data and doing NumPy, Pandas um, and everything. So we can't do anything about that. It, it the, Your worker, your resources are being utilized perfectly fine. So, so far so. However, there are also different types of tasks. Uh, not all the tasks are like this compute intensive or memory intensive task. Um, some of the tasks are similar to one that is shown over here, which is I don't want to compute stuff on worker. I want to offload it to an external system that is specialized for it. Example, data proc. Data proc is managed Spark service in Google Cloud Platform. So I would like to submit a data proc job from my Airflow worker and then just poll the data proc operator. We'll just then poll to see if the data proc job has completed successfully or not. In this scenario, let's say my data proc task takes one hour. Your Airflow worker, one particular worker slot is completely blocked. It used the first initial 30 seconds as an example to just submit the Spark job. And then all it does for 40, 50 minutes is just poll, 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 poll and sleep, poll and sleep. And then once it completes in the last, let's say, uh, five minutes of your hour for, for one hour, it completes the, it, it marks your task as fail, uh, marks your task as succeeded, saying everything fine and done. So, in the first example where everything was so CPU intensive, the task was CPU intensive, the resources were utilized well. But how are the resources being utilized well over here? Your resources are wasted because in most of the 50, 55 minutes uh, in this example, the CPU was idle, the resources were idle. All you were doing is sleep and pull, sleep and pull, um, which is not efficient. And this is a typical operator, right? Not all operators are like this, but this, uh, most of the operators are like that. People want to offload that work to specialized tools um, and, uh, and just use Airflow as an orchestrator. So most of the operators might be like this. Then there is different kind of operator, a special kind of operator called sensors, whose only job is to wait and poll until a criteria is met. For example, um, I want to wait until my file or until my data has arrived in S3 or not. And then based on that, I want to perform a lot of operations on that. So typically your sensor is the first task of your day. Now there are companies and I know some of our customers as well who have, let's say hundred days and the first task in each of them is a sensor. A hundred tasks, hundred tasks are just waiting for some operation and all on the worker, all of them are just waiting, just polling. Just imagine uh, your resources are being literally not utilized well, inefficient usage of your resources. Can, yeah, you can uh, add gigabytes to your worker uh, because of some few tasks that, uh, that are CPU intensive. So those resources are, are not used well, is my main point. So you can see a pattern uh, with this type of submit and poll based operators or all the sensors. The pattern is the resources are completely wasted uh, when what we are doing is literally waiting for this criteria to be met for uh, after the initial, uh, initial compute intensive task or after doing something and then submitting to an external system. So in this case, it is polling for the first example shows the polling for the Spark cluster um, and waiting for the, or waiting for the files to arrive for the S3 sensor. All that a worker thread is doing in that ideal period uh, 
the one that is marked in green, all that overcut thread is doing is waiting on an external system to complete and send the result of it uh, back to the to the worker. And due to that, the worker slot will be blocked until your task gets completed. Until your external system tells, okay, all good. And then we'll move on to the, the second task for on that particular worker slot. Now, imagine if you have tons of tasks like that, like tons of sensors, tons of operators that are port based. Uh, a GCS sensor, an S3 sensor, a Spark operator, again, a big query operator where you just submit a query and then wait for the query to complete its uh, job. And you have like hundreds of these tasks, or let's say 16 tasks. Uh, by default, the salary executor within Airflow has 16 slots. And if all your 16 slots are doing wait, are waiting for an external system to, to tell whether the job has been completed or not, your entire worker is blocked with inefficient tasks, which are all idle and waiting for the task to be completed. So we need a better, we need a better solution to this. Like this is inefficient usage. Um, and this is where the deferable operators are uh, also known as async operators came into the picture. Uh, one of our uh, engineers at uh, astronomer Michael League, Andrew Godwin, uh, he and his team added this feature in Airflow 2.2. Uh, and he gave a really nice talk about uh, the technicalities of it. And this uh, in this year's Airflow Summit, and this talk in my talk is uh, just building on top of it. So I highly recommend uh, watching Andrew's talk uh, in Airflow Summit. A lot of a lot of today's content is based on that. So let's let's think about that in a minute. The middle part in 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 this previous example here, yeah, whole spark cluster was being wasted or the first part in sensor was being wasted. What if we moved it to a different component? Here you see a new component called trigger. That is where we are moving or where that is where we are offloading the work, the idle work. So we move this middle part of, of the last figure that is waiting for an external event uh, to succeed uh, to this new component, uh, which was also like, uh, like I mentioned, was introduced in Airflow 2.2. This component, like this trigger component is designed to run those sort of workloads, to run like thousands of asynchronous Python code um, in a single trigger process where most of what this code uh, does is pull and sleep and, 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 and continues to uh, uh, repeat itself. Uh, this is the main. This is the main job of the trigger. Or else you'll think, hey, you are just moving the load from worker to a different component. How are you actually optimizing it? I'll, I'll explain yeah, it in it in detail. Don't worry. So, async operator. This is what it looks like. When you uh, when when you use async operator, the figure will look like this, where you have two components instead of one. Like we had worker in our last slide, and now we have a, even a trigger. With our earlier Spark example, the worker submits the Spark job and stores the job ID in Airflow's metadata DB and defers itself. Don't worry about this terminology. I'll explain each of them, right? With this async operator, instead, of, once the Spark job is submitted, and instead of pulling it on the worker, what we are doing is, is Retrieving the job ID of it, storing the job ID in Airflow's meta database, and suspending the operation of the of of the task from the worker, and instead running it on triggerer. The triggerer now retries that job ID. It says, "Okay, given the job ID, now I'm a special triggerer. I know how to pull pull using that job ID." Then this part cluster is pulled again and again until the job is completed. The triggerer is not completed once or it fires when once the job is completed. And depending on what your trigger, like what your trigger returns, it can store the API response in the metadata DB along with what next method I need to run. I'll explain that as well in more detail. The only thing that you need to know right now is instead of uh, instead of 
submitting the spark job and still polling on the worker. Now we are suspending it from the worker and instead running out on the triggerer and freeing up the worker slot so that it can run different jobs, different tasks in, in that free slot. Once the polling is complete on the triggerer, it will come back to the worker. The scheduler will create a, a, a task, use the same task and bring it back to the worker with the logs that, that it saved in, in the triggerer files. Like, hey, I'm back to the worker. Uh, this is what your uh, API responded, the task completed with so-and-so response. Here you go to, to show you on, on the UI. Slide shows the difference of how an async operator runs as compared to the non-async one. If you are using salary executor, one worker slot would be entirely consumed when running task one, even if it is idling most of the time of its execution and then run task two. Instead of, instead like with async operators, you can efficiently use the worker slot and move the idling part of execution to the trigger so that other tasks can use the same worker slot. This slide uh, shows the same process that I just explained, right? That the task runs on the worker, then defers itself, suspends its execution from the worker and runs on the triggerer until a criteria is met. Then the execution of the task, once it's complete, jumps back to the worker and completes its execution and set the state of the task. Okay, I completed or I failed, or I completed and failed or I completed and succeeded. Now, I mentioned triggerer a couple of times and trigger a couple of times. Uh, triggerer must be easy because it's a new component that runs a different type of lo a workload. Trigger, on the other hand, is a new concept. The work it's the workload that runs on the triggerer. It's a new concept. It's it's a different it's different uh, concept than the operator. The trigger is different in a way that it has to comply by some design choices um, that, it, that we have made for it to run efficiently. Like it must be written asynchronously uh, using Python's async IO module so that <clears throat> thousands of this, uh, so thousands of this workload, thousands of these triggers can uh, run in the same process. There should be no blocking synchronous call uh, like a database call in the trigger. Uh, there should be none of that. You can use modules like sync to async uh, to make it asynchronous, right? Uh, if you want to definitely do a database call. The second thing is triggers should not store any persistent state. With a trigger, you can't store anything locally. It can retrieve some information from the Airflow uh, meta database uh, when when it starts running, and some in, and send some information to the database when it completes its execution on on the triggerer. But it should not store data, any any data locally on the worker, right? Uh, why we have done that is this allows us more rela uh, more reliability for the triggerer uh, and trigger like such that if multiple triggerer processes are running for HA. Uh, and if one of the triggerer dies and it was running some triggers, the other triggerer can now rerun those triggers. Or let's say for simplicity, even if there is just one triggerer running right now, it is running four or five different triggers. We can restart this component if something goes wrong whenever needed without compromising execution. The new trigger that spawns up can con can just fetch uh, from the database which trigger it needed to rerun and it will just rerun them. Basically allowing us to shuffle these triggers between different triggers. And lastly, it must support multiple copies of itself. This is so that in case where a triggerer loses network connectivity uh, and hence probably loses heartbeat, cluster, the Kubernetes cluster if you have, uh, will think that the triggerer process died and it will spawn up a new triggerer, which will run all the triggers that were running on the first triggerer. It makes it fault tolerant, right? So you should design or you should write your trigger in such a way that you can run multiple copies of itself. Now, 
let's take a look at an example trigger this is a very simple example of a trigger that waits for a specific date and time we, sh we ship a better version a uh, better written version of this trigger with airflow itself um, but for ease of understanding let's let's take this simplified example the trigger fires its, fires itself when the condition is met in this case it fires when the moment or date time that is passed is reached for a for a different trigger for a different kind of trigger like this is daytime trigger for different trigger like s3 trigger the condition might be different that did my files arrive um, in in the s3 bucket or not and it will it will poke and it will sleep uh, here as well it will it will look for that time if it has arrived on or it will just uh, sleep and that that logic is in the run function um, implementation wise you just need these three methods on the trigger one is the init initialization method the init method which is a uh, which is a classic uh, in method nothing standard in method nothing separate serialized method and the run method the serialized method defines what information should be stored in the database so when the when the worker suspends that task and stores some stuff into the database, this is what it shows. It's like, hey, I'm going to suspend my operation, store something into the database so that the uh, triggerer can create a trigger object from that. That's why there's a parity between the initialization method and the serialized method. And then the main logic is in the run function, uh, which is a core routine function. And all it does is it has to yield has to yield uh, a, a trigger event uh, when it fires in this example like it has this infinite while loop that just waits and sleeps until the moment until the time is reached or has already passed then this happens the trigger yields and this is stored in the database you, you can see that it, it doesn't use time or sleep and instead it is using async io sleep with await keyword this is this is async code it is asynchronous code and tells Python to suspend this core routine and then run other core routines in the meanwhile. And then as soon as it frees up uh, running that core routine, uh, it will come back to this core routine again. It knows how to do it. That's its job. So we are just re we are using that concept over here. On the operator side, uh, we have a new method called defer self.defer, which you need to call in the execute method of the operator. Um, the, if you don't know what operator, how the operator runs, it just runs whatever there is in the execute method. The defer method here, like self.defer is called within the execute method. Uh, and it tells Airflow that, it tells Airflow and its worker basically to just suspend execution uh, and suspend itself from the worker and instead run it on the triggerer. Like you need to pass two things for, for suspending it. The triggerer to run, <coughs> sorry, sorry about that. Uh, the first thing is to pass the triggerer that it needs to run. And, and the second thing is the method that needs to be run when, when it is back uh, to the worker. When the trigger fires on the triggerer, what method does it need to run on the worker? That is defined by the method in the second parameter. In this example, we'll just pass in execute complete. Uh, and ex we don't have anything in the execute complete method right now. But if if you want to do, if you want to show some output, uh, or if you want to show some log, um, you can, what you can do is in, in your uh, triggerer, if I go back here, when you are yielding your event uh, in the trigger event, we just currently are passing start to moment. But instead you can pass a, a response saying, hey, task succeeded and here is what the API response was. And then you can look and you can uh, show here uh, in the execute complete method where it also takes an event uh, argument. That event argument is populated by um, the triggerer itself. So it's like when you show it in your task, you can just have, hey, event uh, self.log.info event and then show the event message. So this is a way for you to communicate what happened in the triggerer side. Um, to the task because only the task logs on the UI will not contain trigger logs. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second as well. 
Well, you might you might now tell me, Kakshil, this all looks really good, but uh, are there any readily available async operators or do I need to write one for each of them? The answer is a big, big, big yes. That's why you see a lot of gifts in, in the background over here. Um, we have shipped some of them in the Airflow repo itself and some of them we have uh, shipped it in Airflow and Airflow providers. And then we have built uh, here at Astrom, we have built a few more operators, like tons of, not few, I'll say tons of async or asynchronous operators, 50 plus asynchronous operator for the community uh, to use. So I will talk about Astronomer providers for a second. These operators are part of Astronomer providers repo where we have built main, uh, we have built and written example decks, tested them, added some documentation, and we are going to maintain, we have maintained this and we are going to keep on maintaining them along with, um, along with the example dog, the integration test and everything for each of them. And you can install it using the just pip install astronomer providers. Uh, and then if you, similar to Airflow extras, if you want to use Snowflake, provider, then you can do pip install astronomer providers and add Snowflake as an extra to it. And it will install all the Snowflake uh, dependencies that are needed to run the asynchronous operator. This library is Apache 2 licensed and completely open source. And we have built it for the entire Airflow community, not just for astronomer customers. This is for entire Airflow community. So if you have any feature requests, you can just create an issue over there and we can take care of it. Or if you find bugs and if you want to help us with that, uh, please feel free to create PRs for it. Um, most of the operators that we have built are drop-in replacements of the synchronous version of the operators. So the only thing you need to do is replace the import line. A good number of these operators um, also has open lineage support. Uh, so if you are using open lineage as support, you don't need to do, if you are already using open lineage with Airflow, you don't need to do anything extra. It will just work out of the box. Some of the operators that are available are like all the major cloud providers, AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, uh, major data warehouses, Databricks, Snowflake, uh, Kubernetes, Apache Levy, Apache Hive, and the core uh, providers, uh, HTTP and file system. So this slide just shows an example usage of one of the asynchronous uh, sensors, uh, S3 key sensor, uh, where you only have to replace the import line. The rest of the deck stays the same. This is a drop-in replacement, right? If you are already using S3 pre sensor, you can just change this import line. The import line follows similar structure as Airflow. So from astronomer providers, Amazon AWS sensors S3 import S3 async, S3 key sensor async as S3 key sensor, and that's it. Everything else is the same. But if you don't find the operator, uh, asynchronous operator that is already, that you need, and it's not already available in astronomer providers or uh, Airflow, and you want to build it yourself, it is not that difficult. I, that's why what I want to do is give you a list of caveats if you want to build an asynchronous operator for yourself. So this is what you need to be aware of. <coughs> you will see greater benefits of the differable operator or the differable operator and async operator are the same thing. They are just used interchangeably even in the Afro docs as we can see within this presentation. Um, you, you will see greater benefits of this differable operator if the time taken to poll or wait idly is on the higher side. In one of the benchmarks that we did at Astronomer, when the when the idle time spent by the task by the synchronous task um, on the worker to just like like sleep was more than ten minutes, the reduction in resource usages by using asynchronous operator was ninety percent. Was ninety percent like if the wait time is larger. My point is, if the wait time is larger, you will see longer benefits. You will see greater benefits of using a synchronous operator. If the on the flip side, right, if the wait time is less, it's less than twenty seconds. 
then the overhead of suspending the task from the worker and spawning it up on trigger until it fires and goes back to the worker. It's just not worth it, right? 20 seconds is too less of a time for this overhead. So my recommendation will be to only create an asynchronous operator if the wait time is at least, at least 20, 30 seconds. Like I won't create an async operator to create an empty table. It's, it's a simple operation. I'll just submit an API and the thing is that the table is created. So there is no benefits of using an asynchronous operator over there. So make sure you know that uh, building an asynchronous operator will be beneficial only then to it. Uh, so be, be, be mindful of this. Thing. Um, second is not everything can be deferred for suspending the task from the worker to triggerer you need a unique id so that the triggerer can pull an external system on it in in, in the last example where we we're talking about spark and data proc we will get a job id from data proc google's data proc we know how to then poll that uh, API using an API poll for that job ID. If the external system has no reliable way of giving a unique ID, there's no way we can create a deferrable operator with, with enough confidence. And good example is Postgres. Postgres does not give us a unique query ID. So if I submit a query to Postgres, it does not give me a unique query ID to track whether that query was completed, whether the query is completed or not. I could not reliably make an async Postgres operator. Um, on the other hand, I was able to do that for Snowflake because if you submit a query to Snowflake, it will give you a unique query ID that I can use for querying. So not everything can be uh, deferred. And lastly, the trigger logs, I think I mentioned this at least a couple of times in the presentation already. The trigger logs are not visible to the users on the web server. Only the task logs from the worker are present on the UI, are present on the web server. So make sure you pass enough information when the trigger fires in that trigger event here. <coughs> here in the trigger event where you yield, make sure you pass and probably a JSON object with enough information that you can um, use it in your execute complete method uh, and show it because that will be logged on the worker in the task clause, which will be visible in the UI. So trigger logs are not visible in the web server and UI. And that's it. So thank you very much. Um, do let me know if you have any feedback or questions when you once you start using uh, deferable operators. Thank you.